Okay, so let's set up a simple physical situation. I'm going to take a wall. Imagine this is on a space station. Take a wall and then attach a spring to that wall. And then at the bottom of that spring, put some kind of mass. And then attach another spring to that. And at the bottom of that spring, put another mass. And continue. So another spring, another mass. Another spring, another mass. Another mass. And at the very bottom, one more spring, and then a wall. So this, all the springs are attached to either a mass or a wall, or two masses. So mass one, mass two, keep going, I don't know, mass n. Suppose that I have masses, say, m1 through mn. I have n masses, and they're attached by, well, how many springs is that? I guess it's exactly one more spring than I have masses. I have n plus one springs. And let me assume that the stiffness of the springs varies. So one of them could be a slinky, while another one could be an industrial strength steel spring. So there, those springs are connecting all the masses, and I'm not going to assume, again, I said this would be on like some kind of space station. Don't assume that gravity is acting just yet. Um, now, No forces are acting yet. When you apply a force, let's say positive forces are downward in this picture. Apply a force to some mass. You could apply it to just mass M1, or masses M2 and M3, or all of the masses. So apply a downward force to some of the masses. What happens? So what happens when I apply some forces? Well, a new configuration is exactly what happens. So the question that I want to ask is, if I know all the spring stiffness, and I know exactly what force I apply, can I predict the new equilibrium position of the masses? Right? They started out in equilibrium, presumably. If I nudge M2 downward a little bit, well, that might stretch the string just above M2 and compress the string just below M2, and it's all going to depend on how what forces I apply to the other masses also. So can I predict the new equilibrium position? And the answer to that question is yes, or we wouldn't be watching this video. So the whole video is going to be about seeing exactly how that's done, analyzing the situation prior to actually constructing the experiment. Okay, so let's zoom in on this picture a little bit and look at just one of the springs and see if we can understand a little bit more about what's going on. So let me, let me pick the jth spring. Here, J, I'm going to pick a spring in the middle, so not the very first or very last spring. So this spring is going to be suspended between two masses. And I've switched colors for some reason. Sorry about that. I hope it won't be confusing. So now my masses are red and my springs are blue. And so the top mass is going to be mass, well, j minus 1, if I'm looking at the jth spring. And the bottom mass is going to be mass j. So this is the picture as it looks before I apply any force. Now I'm going to apply a force. I'm going to nudge uh, downward on, or possibly upward if I apply a negative force on some of the masses. So. After forces are applied, my picture is going to look pretty similar, but mass J minus 1 might be a little bit further down, and mass J might be a little bit further down too, let's say. And the spring between them it should be blue. Pretend it's blue. The spring between them uh, is maybe a little bit longer. It could be a little bit shorter if this spring actually comp compressed, but the point is that the spring might have changed length. So if I look at the displacement of the j minus first mass that's drawn here on the diagram, I want to name that displacement. Uh, let's call it u sub j minus 1. So u sub j minus 1 is the displacement of the j minus first mass. And similarly, if you look for the displacement of the jth mass, um, it's drawn on the picture there. Let's call that uj. Now, from uj and uj minus 1, you can determine the elongation of the spring 
And it's not too hard to see that it's just the difference, the displacement of the jth mass minus the displacement of the j minus first mass. Now, let's analyze the top and the bottom spring just for a second. So the top spring, well, the, dis the elongation is exactly the displacement of the first mass, and we'll draw a picture for that in just a moment. Uh, the bottom spring, the picture is going to look really similar, so the the n plus first elongation, the, the, the compression or elongation of the last spring, is just minus the displacement of the last mass. So let's draw the top picture. So I have my wall, and I have my spring, and I have my little mass at the bottom of it. It's back to being red springs now. So I draw that picture, uh, and then I nudge the mass downward a little bit. Well, so the displacement is exactly the same as the elongation. That's how much the spring has stretched out. So the whole point is that as soon as I know all of my displacements, if I know u1 through un, the displacements of my n masses, that's exactly what it means to know the new configuration. I'll know exactly where the masses will end up after I've applied my forces. So I just need to find my uns. OK, so all of that information, there's a lot of equations, and they're all linear. So why don't we put it all in vector form? We can put everything in terms of matrices and vectors, which will make it at least more compact. And maybe we'll be able to see more about how linear algebra should apply. So I'm going to put all my, all my elongations in a vector. There are n plus 1 of them. So this is a vector with n plus 1 entries. And I'm going to put all my displacements in a vector, but there's only n of them. That is a vector with n entries. So my e, I'll call my elongation vector. And my u, I'll call my displacement vector. So again, the coordinates of these two vectors are related in a particular way. They're related by the following equations. I know that in the middle, so for j running from 2 up to n, that my jth elongation is the di dif difference between the jth and the j minus first displacements. And the first elongation is just the first displacement, and the last elongation is just minus the last displacement. So I can express this as a matrix equation. I can write E as A times U. That's a comma, not a J. E is A times U, where A is the following matrix. Uh, I put a 1 on the main diagonal and a minus 1 just below it. And then a 1 on the main diagonal, a minus 1 just below it. And proceed in that way. Put zeros ev everywhere else. Uh, one. So ones are uh, on the diagonal and zeros below. So uh, in order to see what's going on here, I think it's worth writing a small example down. So if I take just two masses, then I'll have three springs. So what are my, my equations? Uh, E1 is U1. E2 is U2 minus U1. And E3 is minus U3. Now, if you tried to write that down the, in terms of the matrices, you would exactly write the matrix 1 minus 1, 0, 0, 1 minus 1. So stare at that for a minute until you believe it. So now I've got my displacement set up. I'm going to apply my external forces, my finger that's nudging the masses downwards. So that external force is going to be matched by an internal force. And I want to describe that inter internal force now. So when I push uh, down on some masses, the springs are going to push back. That's how springs work. Those forces that the springs will exert back in the other direction, I'm going to call internal forces, internal to the system. So the controlling assumption that I'm going to make here is that the elongations are small, not too big. If the elongations that I apply to the springs are too big, well, you know what happens when you take a slinky and you stretch it out too far. Uh, you also know what happens when you take a regular uh, spring that's not coiled quite as tight as a slinky and you 
squish it too far. It loses its springiness. So as long as the elongations are small enough, Hooke's law becomes relevant. So if I let yj be the force that the spring is applying in resistance to, to change, then, I mean, j at the spring, then you can express yj as uh, just a constant multiple of the elongation. That should be an ej. I'm sorry about this, so let me rewrite that. yj should be cj times ej, where cj is the spring constant. It's some positive number that measures how stiff the spring is. So in physics class, you might have seen that as a k sub j, but c is what I'm going to use for this video. And it, it's just the spring constant. So it's a good idea to take all of these internal forces and stick them in a vector. It seems to have been going well so far. So that's y1 through y how many forces? Well, there's n plus 1 springs. It must be n plus 1 internal forces. And I can express the y's in terms of the e's very easily with a nice diagonal matrix c1, c2 through c n plus 1. Those are the spring constants of the springs. So it's easy to verify that y is, let's name this matrix C, uh, C times E. Notice that this matrix C is positive definite because it's diagonal and all of the entries are positive. That's going to come into play later. OK, so let's finally apply our external forces. And I suppose I should name them. So uh, to the first mass, I'll apply a force F1 downward, the second mass F2, and so on. The nth mass, I apply force Fn downward. For simplicity, I'm going to assume that I only apply force to the masses and not to the springs. That is a simplifying assumption that means that I don't have to deal with the force of gravity on the spring itself, which would involve a bunch of integrals. I don't want to do that. So instead, the Gravity or whatever other force only applies to the mass. Assumes the, assume that the masses are much larger than the springs. So the question is, what's the internal force on the ith mass? As soon as I know that, I'll be able to get uh, an equation. So let's draw the picture. If I take the ith mass, there's a spring coming up from it. There's a spring coming down below it. The ith spring is applying a resisting force to the force I've applied downward, upward, uh, yi. And the i plus first spring is applying its resisting force downward. So that means that the internal force on the mass is exactly given by yi minus yi plus 1, because they're facing in opposite directions. But the whole point is that if I've reached an equilibrium position, then the force that I applied on the ith mass must be equal to this internal force for each i. So my force vector can be expressed in terms of the y's with a very simple matrix where I put ones on the diagonal and minus ones above the diagonal. And multiply that matrix by the internal force vector. Now, there's something that I want you to notice, that this matrix that I have here is exactly the transpose of the matrix A that I had before, which is almost magical. Uh, and that's going to allow us to get away with uh, some simple computations. So what I have is that the force vector is A transpose times the internal force vector. So the external force vector is A transpose times internal. What I want is U at the end of the day, the displacements. And I know that E is A times U. I know that Y is C times E. And I know that F is A transpose times Y. So let's see if we can get a set up an equation for U, because I know F and I want U. Well, F, that's A transpose Y. And if I substitute in Y is CE, then F is A transpose times CE. 
So pull the C out by distributivity and substitute it for E, substitute A times U, excuse me, let me erase that. For E, substitute A times U. And you see that you have force expressed as A transpose CA times U. But A transpose CA is a positive definite matrix. It's exactly a weighted gram matrix. Notice, remember that the columns of A were linearly independent. So this is really essentially just a gram matrix. It's positive definite. In particular, the whole thing is far and away invertible, which means that this equation has a unique solution. So now that I have an equation, it's a good idea to do an explicit concrete example. Uh, suppose that I have three masses, so that I have four springs. And let me choose my spring constants to be uh, one, two, one, and two. Ignore, ignore units, let me just use numbers. So let me define K to be that gram matrix, A transpose CA. Uh, so let's write it out. Uh, A transpose is going to be a three by four in this case. And it's going to have ones down the diagonal and minus ones above the diagonal. Zeros elsewhere. And then I'm going to multiply by C, which has got to be a 4 by 4 because there are four springs. And it's going to be a diagonal matrix, and it's going to write 1, 2, 1, 2 for the spring constants of the springs. The zeros elsewhere. And finally, I multiply by A, which has got 1s down the diagonal and minus 1s below the diagonal. And it has to be, if A transpose was a 3 by 4, this is a 4 by 3. Okay, so this matrix is not terribly complicated to multiply out. Um, I trust you to check this yourself, but when you multiply it, you get 3 minus 2, 0, minus 2, 3, minus 1, 0, minus 1, 3. So believe me if you insist. So suppose that I apply a unit force downwards to the middle mass. Some of these springs are stiffer than others, so you don't expect all of the masses to move uniformly. Anyway, what's my force vector? Well, 0, 1, 0. Remember that downwards is positive. The question then is, what are the displacements? And the whole point is that I've set up my equation so that all I have to do is compute k u equals f, find u, solve for u. And that's easy. You know how to take the inverse of the 3x3 three three matrix. If, or if you don't remember how to do that, you can at least row reduce to get this equation. So uh, it turns out that u is 1 half, 3 quarters, 1 quarter. And from that, you can, if you like, compute e. So e, remember, is the elongations. And that is just a times u. And it's 1 half, 1 quarter minus one half, minus one quarter. So you see that what's going on is that the top spring, uh, so rather the middle spring is uh, moving, the middle mass is moving the furthest. The top two springs are expanding and the bottom two springs are compressing, which is what you would expect, but you might not have expected that they expand and compress in exactly these ratios. And that's what this allows us to compute. So there's a slightly subtle point that I want to make here uh, about the difference between a statically determinate system and a statically indeterminate system. So the point is that the force balance law that I had that told me that my forces, my internal and external forces had to balance, that was written external force equals A transpose times internal force. Well, that's not enough to determine why all by itself. I have to go through getting u. And the reason that that's not enough to determine y is that A transpose isn't even a square matrix. There's no way this can have a unique solution. So just knowing y, you don't get to know f. Or rather, just knowing f, you don't, my apologies.
Just knowing the external forces is not enough to determine the internal forces in this system. Instead, you have to compute the displacements to get there. I mean, you have to pass through uh, U and then reconstruct the elongation vectors and the internal force. So we say that this system is statically indeterminate. The static forces are not immediately, instantly determined by the external forces. But I can change the system a little bit, make it into a slightly different system. What I'm going to do is remove the bottom plate. And that small change is going to render it into a determinate system. So let's see what happens when you do that. So all that I'm going to do to make my statically determinate system, well, let's draw the picture again. So I have my top plate, and dangling from it, I have some spring, at the bottom of which is a mass, below which is another spring, and another mass at the bottom of that, and so on. And I end up with a mass, and then another spring, and a mass at the very bottom, dangling in space. No plate uh, for that. So now I have the same number of masses as I have springs, which is going to mean that my matrices are square. And you can tell just from their form that they're going to be non-singular. So all that happens is that this matrix A that we computed that related the elongations to the displacements, that matrix just loses its last row. And when that happens, you get a matrix of this form instead. So now you have a square matrix with ones on the diagonal and minus ones below the diagonal. All of the same equations hold, uh, matrix equations, but I'm replacing my A with this new A that's a square matrix. So Y is CE, E is AU, and F is A transpose Y, where Y is the internal force, F is the external force, U is the displacement, and E is the elongation. So A transpose is non-singular now, and so from the external force, I can immediately recover the internal force by inverting a transpose. So I don't have to go through U and E in order to get to Y. I can know the internal forces of this system immediately just from knowing what forces I apply externally. That was not true of the old system, but it is true of this one. Now, this video is getting a little bit long, so let's just do one more example. Suppose I have an example with uh, three masses again and three springs that are dangling. There's no bottom plate. And let me say that all of the masses are the same. Uh, M1, M2, and M3 all have the same mass, M. And let me pick some spring constants. Uh, first spring has constant 2, second spring has constant 6, and third spring has constant 1. So that uh, second spring is much stiffer than the other two. So my matrix A is really nice. It's a square matrix, diagonal, except for on the lower diagonal, you've got minus ones. So I apply, let's say I apply gravity to the masses. Then my force vector looks like, well, mass times gravity on every mass. And somehow that's equal to A transpose times Y, where Y is the internal force vector. Okay. Well, the thing is that A transpose is non-singular, so you can invert it. And in fact, in this case, it has a really nice inverse. I encourage you to compute the inverse. So Y turns out to be 3 times mass times gravity, 2 times mass times gravity, and mass times gravity. So uh, the internal force uh, applied by the first spring is three times the internal force applied by the last spring. And if you like, you can now determine the elongations of the springs, because you know that y is c times e, where c is the diagonal matrix with entries 2, 6, and 1. Use the inverse of that, which is easy, to compute 
E, that's 3 halves mass times gravity, 1 third mass times gravity. Mass times gravity, those are the elongations of the springs. And if you like, you can now find the displacements. So displacement is given by, uh, well, AU is E, and you know E now. So you can get U easily by inverting A. And these are the numbers that you get. So let's just interpret these just for a minute. So the, let me draw this picture just one more time. So I've got a plate and a spring coming down from it. And then the first mass with mass M. And then another spring, which is much stiffer. And then the same mass. And then one more spring, which is the weakest spring. And then again, the same mass. So, because C2 is, all right, so I apply this downward force. Um, gravity pulls down on these three masses. C2, uh, this middle spring, is the stiffest spring. It's the one that wants to stretch the least. And C3 is the, the weakest spring. It's the most willing to stretch. Well, that first spring is going to elongate the most. And that's because there are three masses to pull it. So you see that it's it's stretching much further than any of the others. Although again, without doing this calculation, you wouldn't know. While that's intuitive, you wouldn't know from your intuition exactly how much it should stretch. Uh, this last one is a weak spring. And so its, it's elongation is the second highest. And finally, this stiff spring stretches the least only uh, a third as much as the as the weak spring. Okay, I think that's enough, and so I will see you in class.